So good afternoon. Um, I'm Kim Whedon. I'm the director of the Institute for the Social Sciences. Um, usually what I do at this point is introduce the ISS and give a little spiel about the theme projects. Um, I actually gave all my talking points this morning to um, uh, the, uh, Bob um, Berman, the director of the OVPR, who is essentially my boss. Um, and I don't want to repeat those talking points now. Um, I was actually joking that perhaps I should uh, recite the last page of The Great Gatsby, which I could do um, for you, but I think I'd rather not. Um, what I'd rather do is to just opine, maybe think out loud a little bit about, about some of the lessons from today, um, and also sort of the broader lessons of the, of the ISS, and thinking in particular about, about two phenomenon. Um, one is the fragmentation of disciplines, um, but the other is the fragmentation of knowledge outside of the disciplines and how that's been exacerbated uh, by really a changing connection between human and land and human and community. Um, I think the fragmentation of, of disciplines is, is obvious to all of us. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own work because I'm an academic and that's what I do. Um, I've had the occasion to, uh, to do a, a study of adolescents and their occupational aspirations. Um, lo and behold, no one says they want to be a naturalist anymore, right? So 100 years ago, you might ask adolescents what they wanted to do when they grew up, and they would say, I want to be a naturalist. Um, now that's about as common as being a pterodactyl. Um, about as many young people want to be pterodactyls when they grow up as, as want to be naturalists. The same thing is actually true with social scientists, right? Nobody says they want to be a social scientist. They may say they want to be an economist. They may say they want to be an anthropologist. A few uh, extraordinarily misguided souls may say they want to be a sociologist, but they never say they want to be a social scientist. This uh, fragmentation, of course, has made it very difficult uh, for people across the disciplines to talk to each other. Disciplinary conversation uh, becomes limited, often in very frustrating ways, ways that involve reinventing a lot of wheels. We tend to, to study similar topics, but not engage with others who are studying the same topic. We don't learn from each other, we end up reinventing the wheel. This fragmentation can also take place within disciplines as well. So I suspect uh, within economics, the labor economist doesn't often speak to the behavioral economist. Neither one of them speak to the econometrician because she's just going to tell them her, their models are all wrong anyway. Yeah. Um, but the same thing happens outside of academia as well. Right? We have um, a, a sort of a changing relationship with the land and much more specialization such that communities no longer share a common knowledge, a common language, a common ability to talk to each other. I think nowhere is this more evident than when I was growing up in Alaska in the 1970s. Uh, there was a huge, enormous um, debate and discussion and effort to put in a pipeline. Uh, it turns out that civil engineers weren't talking to the petroleum engineers who weren't talking to the geologists and none of them were talking to the First Peoples leaders who could have told them perfectly well that what seems like a good idea in Oklahoma of running hot oil through a pipe turns out not to be a very good idea when the ground is frozen. These are just a, one example of how a failure to communicate uh, created in this case an enormous uh, economic and environmental disasters of various sorts. This fragmentation of knowledge about the land and about place, I think, is exacerbated and is exacerbating um, the, the very changed relationship between community and place and, and humans and, and community. So human cultures were, of course, as any anthropologist can tell you, once cultures of place. For most of human history, humans adapted to place. And most of the cultures as well were adaptations to local uh, environmental conditions. Today, we're no longer as constrained by land and by place um, or by changes in place. More often, we are the ones who are changing the place and we're adapting to self-generated changes in place, in land, in resources. We lack that naturalist understanding um, of 100 years ago. Where we choose to live often becomes little more than an expression of our personal preference, and perhaps limited by the exigencies of, of where the jobs are, um, and perhaps whether we prefer to walk our dog in open field or uh, through a forest. This weakening connection of, of place, um, of humans to place and to land, has had enormous consequences for the environment, um, but it also, of course, weakens the ties that bind us all together. And the world of academia here, too, is no less immune to this than anything else. We can spend an enormous amount of our time as academics in a very, very small physical space that's in some sense doesn't really matter where it is, right? With global technologies, we can communicate with students across the world, uh, in a, as, as Kareem did this morning. Um, and we can also engage intellectually with people who are all across uh, the nation, the world, and so forth. We don't even necessarily need to, to communicate with the person down the hall, um, let alone with the person in a different department. 
the ISS and the ISS theme projects are in no small way an institutional effort to try and come, overcome both the fragmentation of disciplines and also that sort of weakening connection that we all have as academics to the fellow travelers who are with us here at uh, Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And I think the land team, more than any other project uh, that the ISS has supported, has really embodied some of these uh, ideas of, of connection, of bringing together accumulated knowledge of the disciplines and subfields. One aspect of this is the unusual diversity of the members of the land team in terms of the disciplines that they re represent. So there's anthropology, there's history, there's sociology, there's development sociology, there's natural resources, there's science and technology studies, there's economics, there's geography, and there's history, right? Enormous array um, of disciplines that are represented within the team members. I also think this team has been unusually successful, perhaps more so than any other team that we've had, in bringing together scholars from around campus outside the team to think holistically about, about land and about connections to land and about the changing nature of human land relationships. We've seen that today, uh, for example, in panels that bring together a crop and soil scientist, a landscape architect, and an anthropologist to talk to each other and to learn from each other. If there were a bar involved, it would be the start to a joke, I think. <laughs> The, the capstone lecture today um, is going to highlight some of the many tangible accomplishments of this team throughout the last three years. I'd also talk a lot about how they plan to continue and to keep that momentum going forward. I don't want to catalog all these accomplishments here. I don't want to steal their thunder. Um, I do want to highlight an intangible accomplishment of this team. Um, it's not going to appear in any annual report. It's not going to appear on any individual person's CVs. Not because it isn't important, because it's very difficult to measure. So beyond the papers and the books that the team has, present, has produced, beyond the workshops and the conferences, uh, beyond the grant proposals written and funded, beyond the number of students taught in courses, beyond all those tangible markers of success that make administrators and bean counters uh, relatively happy. I'm not sure if I count as a bean counter. I hope not, um, but there you go. Um, I think this team is to be celebrated for, for really creating um, and, and building a new community. It's been a privilege to watch this team and support and grow for, with each other um, um, to become a community in all the best senses of that word through good times and in bad times. Um, and it's going to be a privilege to watch this team to continue to grow in the future. With that, I want to, first of all, acknowledge um, two other people at the ISS who have been extremely important in, in uh, helping out with the team um, and, and making it all flow smoothly. I rely on them more than I think they ever can imagine. That's Annalisa Truame and Lori Sonkin, uh, who, have, who have helped here. Please help join me in giving them a round of applause. And I also, with that, want to turn over the floor to Steve Kyle, uh, who's going to uh, introduce the next panel, the next lecture. Thank you. Uh, I was asked to introduce Chuck Geisler and Wendy Walford, who have been our leaders for three years now. Um, the official introduction is this, that they're both professors of development sociology. Chuck uh, has also an international faculty member in CALS, and his research for years has tracked contested landscapes in the United States, Ethiopia, the Dominican Republic, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Japan and probably a lot of other places, and has asked questions about how each of these states have responded using land reforms, land use regulations, the public trust doctrines, outright enclosures, and military occupations. Wendy, is, who is also a professor in development, so she, also an international professor, and the associate director of economic development for the Atkinson Center, uh, has research interests that feature, among other things, the political economy and geography of development, especially in Brazil, where she spent a lot of time, most recently, she has followed the transfer of the Brazilian outlook on development to Sub-Saharan Africa in Mozambique, a place which I also think is a great place to go to, and one of the epicenters of major land deals uh, of what uh, some call the global farms race, the agricultural land grab uh, that is ongoing around the world. You can read a lot more online. You can look at their CVs and all the things they've done. But one thing I want to add to all of this, uh, I was thinking, what would somebody from outside the, the institute or outside the team not really see uh, if they just went to this event or one of the other events or courses or seminars or series of seminars or conferences over the last three years? And that is the phenomenal amount of work that Chuck and Wendy have put into all of this from 
thinking of it in the first place, writing the grants, recruiting the team, putting it all together, inventing courses, seminar series, conferences, this conference, conferences in the future, books, papers, on and on. The amount of work is not evident, and they have been there through so many meetings for literally years that right now, I want them, they're gonna thank other people, no doubt. Let's all give them a round of applause because because they, they deserve it more than any of the rest of us for this one. And so, Chuck and Wendy, over to you. Thank you to both Kim and Steve. Um, for those introductions. Kim very cleverly had us thank Lori and Annalise, which meant that we didn't clap for you, but that was a beautiful introduction. <laughs> very clever. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be following this day of presentations. In April of the year 1500, an aging knight turned secretary penned a letter to his king a letter that would become famous and place both author and the letter itself in the annals of history. Writing to King Manuel I of Portugal, the secretary, Pedro Vaz de Caminha, wrote with great excitement and detail, a poetry of witness. The sailing ship sponsored by the king had discovered land, and Caminha marveled over the abundant trees, the fertile land, and the salubrious climate, which he compared to the ideal, that of Portugal itself. He wrote with an almost indecent pleasure of the innocence of the natives who seemed keen for salvation and whose attire and adornments suggested the possibility of gold and other riches further inland. The leader of the expedition, Pedro Álvarez de Cabral, claimed the new and rich land for the King of Portugal, naming it the Ilha de Veracruz, or the land of the True Cross in the year of our Lord, 1500. The lengthy letter from Camilla named his encounter with a new land and people a finding. And at that moment, and in that place, a finding by the Portuguese was no minor thing. A finding was both a discovery and a claim. And the finding of the territory that came to be called Brazil was one of many in what would soon become known to the Western world as the Age of Discovery. New routes to the west and to the east of Europe gave access to land, to new products, and to power. Empires rose and fell with ambitions of claiming land and the riches therein. Territory, in its solid and liquid form, was the currency of the age and the act of discovery. So what exactly is a discovery? Discoveries are not things or events or even happy accidents, in Victor's words, although they are often accidental. Fundamentally, discoveries are relationships. They are, more than any other form of knowledge, predicated on ignorance, on not having known. The translation of a finding into a discovery is shaped by the balance of forces at any, any given moment, any given conjuncture, by who has the guns, the gold, and the ear of the king, and ultimately, who is powerful enough to make a virtue out of ignorance. Karl Marx said in volume one of Capital, and here all of my students are shuddering, having said this many times before, Karl Marx said that we should start our analysis of capitalism with the commodity, because the commodity was the smallest unit of the system that contained within it all of the necessary elements of that system. Discovery is perhaps another such unit, one that contains within it all of the necessary elements of the global system, contact, conquest, colonialism, claiming, creating, and of course, contestation. Brazil's history, the land and the people within, was critically shaped by the construction of its own discovery, of its own finding. This is no less true for the Yukon, Francophone North Africa, China, the Open Seas, the United States, the Adirondacks, Southern Africa, or other imagined communities. How the land is known, what the soil is considered good for, what gods the natives will serve, how the riches imagined within, the treasure house, in Victor So's words, all of this will ignite further accumulation. All of this is a privilege of discovery. 
400 years later and long after Brazil had gained independence, José Emilio Pinheiro de Azevedo of Lisbon, Portugal, wrote to the head administrator of the Compañía de Mozambique, the private company given control over the settlement of Portugal's relatively new possession in eastern South Africa. Jose Emilio had read about the opportunities for accessing land in this area and wishing to, quote, dedicate his youth to the benefit of country and household, he asked for information as to the quality of the land and possibilities for obtaining a concession. The reply was immediate and authoritative. There was no ecological risk assessment, in Peter's words. The letter in return lacked the exuberance of Pirovais de Caminha, but conveyed many of the same facts. The region, the letter said, had been completely pacified and boasted fertile land and seemingly endless water, infinita. The weather was very much like Europe's and along the coast particularly appropriate for women and small children. Among the cultivars the administrator recommended as most well suited for the new territory, given its situation and its climate, were sugarcane and corn. Although, as in Daniel Lemunia's story, absentee landowners with larger plots of land were drawn to forests, or in this case, to rubber trees. Crops like sugar and corn were not native, but they were profitable, and the company was establishing teaching gardens to help new colonists develop, as Ian Bailey might say, an agrarian ethic. All that was needed to make good on the discovery and exploration of this new land was dedication, some few pecuniary resources, and moral fortitude. In return for a small fee, the company would outline the dimensions of the land to be conceded, what Margot might call design drawing with all that that implies, particularly given the measurement being done with straight lines unmoored from topographical specificities, much like the McCarr drawing of freeway design. And the company would help to engage indigenous labor as the natives were unreliable and used unsustainable methods if left to themselves. 100 years in a brutal war for independence later, Brazil is an independent country, and so too is Mozambique. Portugal continues on, much less powerful in the global system, but with its monuments to the age of discovery. And now it is the Brazilians who are in Mozambique, who are surveying the land for its usefulness, astonished by the discovery of what the US Agency for International Development calls the quote-unquote vast untapped agricultural potential of northern Mozambique, a region characterized by perhaps the highest high yield gap in the world, where the potential for agricultural production is as yet significantly more than the natives have achieved. The uncertainty behind this potential and the contestation over land that is already inhabited, even if inefficiently, is hidden in what Victor this morning called the rhetoric of absolute numbers, or absolute certainty. To take advantage of this potential, the Brazilian government is transferring its scientific prowess in the area of agricultural production to implement a logic of intensification, in Ian Bailey's words, new methods to make the ill-used fields of northern Mozambique into the breadbasket of southern Africa that it has long been expected to be. The brilliant Brazilian projects, the best known of which is called Pro Savanna, have to be situated within the broader conjuncture of what people have called the global land grab. This is the somewhat sensational name adopted by activists and scholars alike as of 2009 to describe the rise or return of land, both good land and marginal land in Peter's study, but the return of land overall as one of the most attractive commodities in the contemporary global economy. While the numbers, the definitions, and the dynamics are debated and used to different purposes by different um, actors, it seems clear that there has been a rush to acquire land over the past decade. Conservative estimates suggest that the amount of land changing hands annually has increased 15-fold over the annual average for the preceding 40 years. All of this has happened in the wake of several different crises around food and rural resources. The cliff of the crisis, as David Rojas said, from the global food crisis of 2007, 2008, to climate change, to concerns around peak oil and the search for new energy sources, and ongoing environmental degradation, as illustrated in Jeff Milder's presentation. In the face of concern about these converging crises, 
Investors from national governments facing food deficits to agribusiness firms to hedge funds have begun looking to land as a particularly secure asset. The search for land has been called the new scramble for Africa. 500 years after Peru, Peru Vais de Camilla, and 100 years after José Emilio Pinheiro de Azevedo, I should rethink the constant invoking of Portuguese words. It's a different positioning of your tongue. The discovery is once again, or still, predicated on the discovery of land that is not fulfilling its potential. The question is, as Victor said today, how are different forms of knowledge complicit in the development of imperial projects and ambitions? What has changed over the 500 years and what has not? How is remote sensing better or worse at understanding conditions on the ground than colonial expeditions and letters? Or how will farming be different in space? The question that Victor So and Jeff Milder left us with is, who is blindsided? Or to quote Dana in another sense, will the earth remember? Discovery is not only a good lens for understanding the global system, it is also a good lens for thinking about the past three years. And our time here as an ISS theme project. These were three years of pretty intense discovery um, on many levels. And speaking for myself, at least, each discovery was pretty tightly linked to my own ignorance in that a discovery is always things you didn't know. As a collective of sorts, we have discussed the different meanings of land and territory for different groups, the construction of property through the legalization of norms and conventions, the formation of the state through negotiations over and on the land, in frontiers and along borders, the nature of ecosystems or humanized ecologies, in Wesley's words, as dynamic relationships between organic and inorganic bodies and economic systems that demand and resist measurement and commodification, often in surprising ways. The role of water as input, pathway, and landscape as so often the ground on which the struggles for territory and power were and are fought. And the analytical and material importance of separations, the separation of price and production, as in David Kay's presentation of natural gas in the northeastern US, and the separation of wildlife and land in American ownership in Dara's presentation. You see all of these discussions, all of these linkages in the presentations today and over the past three years. These presentations truly demonstrate the wealth of scholarship and interest on campus on issues related to land, to territory, to landscapes. I speak for both Chuck and me when I say that we've been truly honored to spend the last three years, and hopefully to spend many more, surrounded by the energy, the insight, and the initiative of this land team and also the community at Cornell. We have much more to say by way of thanks, um, but for now I'll turn it over to Chuck for a description of what we have done. Kim, thank you so much, and Wendy, thank you. Uh, the uh, word you use to describe uh, the malaise that we confront so often in the university of segmentation is, is uh, exceedingly true, and we hope that this project has uh, tackled that and, and affected it in a positive way, especially around this uh, I guess the original cloud of uh, land and uh, a very encompassing and broad topic. It's been just hugely enjoyable to bring it together and experience uh, what the other team members have brought to uh, the regular table over the three years, but just as much as the team itself, it's been the affiliates. And please excuse the fact the reality that we didn't engage you to the fullest. Today was so uh, abundantly evident of what you offer, have offered, been offering, and will offer in the future. And uh, it is our utmost desire as team leaders and team members that the affiliates around campus as well as the team members will continue on in some structured institutional form. And we'll say a little bit more about that 
uh, in a bit. Steve, I uh, thank you as well for the kind introduction. Um, I, in, in uh, preparation for sort of summarizing at least some of the team accomplishments, I wrote a, a, a letter to the different team members and said, send me uh, a couple of lines on what you've been doing in the time since we kicked off uh, and are now capping things. And uh, all of the team members did that. And I looked at it and I thought, gosh, at least half of us have deviated significantly from what we said we were going to do. And I think for the better, uh, I think it's been uh, creative deviations and we've gone in new ways and we'll go back and to use Wendy's word, discover uh, things that we initially proposed on new terms. But um, when I got those and looked at those several lines from each of you, thank you, uh, I decided not to use them, at least in the, <laughs> in the way you uh, thought I was going to use them. And that was going to be just kind of reading off perhaps a paragraph on, on what you've done. Not that you don't deserve uh, lots and lots of recognition and the, uh, the students and colleagues both on and off campus, the staff uh, that have done those things with you, uh, I want to recognize. But I thought instead, and um, Wendy was comfortable with this, so um, as I listened to the wonderful presentations by the affiliates that volunteered to present today, um, it occurred to me that perhaps it would be at least as useful to enumerate some of the things that we thought we accomplished collectively. That is, uh, more than uh, one of us uh, weighed in in that particular area. So what I'd like to do very briefly here is enumerate, uh, with some uh, examples from the team, things that we have done. And then I thought it'd be interesting, in light of the fact that we intend to go on with some uh, institutional structure, a land institute, or whatever in the future, that I also list some of the things that we did not do. And that's obviously an open-ended list, and uh, creativity in the future will um, breathe life into that. But um, let me start with some of the things that I feel we have done, and my apologies for obvious omissions that will be here. Um, as Wendy just so nicely said in your summary, out of uh, her particular work, both connecting Portugal, but in particular Brazil, Mozambique, East Africa, um, I think all of us have put our oars in new waters with regard to overviews and ethnographies of large, very rapidly, rapid and often hugely displacing and dispossessing land transfers, referred to variously as acquisitions, usurpations, uh, neo-colonial projects, uh, land grabs, et cetera, land rushes. Um, that was probably what uh, brought us together initially and has brought us back together throughout the project. Uh, Steve Wolf, for instance, uh, has helped us think about that in northern New York within the blue line of the Adirondacks uh, with graduate students and colleagues to be sure. But uh, the transfer of very, very, some of the largest timber tracts transferred in the history of the country have been taking place recently. And Steve has helped us to appreciate that. Uh, Paul, Ray, Wendy, and Sarah have all worked on different kinds of colonial uh, land annexations and projects. Um, probably you have as well, Steve. Um, Wendy has been particularly thoughtful about, as you heard her say, south-south transfers, um, taking the so-called Brazilian miracle abroad to former Portuguese colonies and uh, playing it out and seeing what happens with that expertise, those property forms, those, those uh, ethnic and uh, uh, nationalist bonds. Um, a second area has been Im the impacts and consequences 
of these transfers, as well as some work very recently by Wendy and uh, several graduate students uh, on the project producing a new uh, guest journal on the motivations of these transfers. Um, so for instance, Sarah has uh, temporarily set aside the work that she was going to do on the French Mediterranean zone, a lot of the land water uh, controversies in that part of the world, and instead undertaken a book length project on the issue of dark sky reserves, regions of the world that produce very little light produce, uh, pollution, but at the same time have uh, another quality to them, that they, there's equity and justice issues because many of those areas which are um, kind of akin to the green grabbing work that, that several of the team members and you in the audience have undertaken, uh, this is about people who might love to have electricity and light and uh, suffer a little light pollution, even if it goes against the uh, ecological grain of others. Um, almost all of us, if you use a very expensive, expansive definition of land reform, have or land use policy reform, almost all of the team members have uh, worked on that in one form or another. Uh, Wendy, Steve, uh, Kyle, myself, uh, in traditional forms, uh, but uh, for instance, the work by uh, Sarah and uh, Steve Wolf on new and uh, progressive forms of land governance um, in different circumstances, conditions. Uh, Ian Bailey so nicely uh, in his presentation today talked about land, um, the, the re-agrarianization that's going on in his case in Northern California, but obviously elsewhere in the country. That could be seen as a form of land reform, land uh, revitalization on uh, community livelihood thereon. Water land entanglements, to borrow a term from uh, Sarah. Um, nicely, it's the case Ray has been interested in ocean enclosures since day one of the project, actually before. Um, and um, several other people. Steve, for instance, is quite interested in the offshore gas developments in East Africa and what their onshore indirect impacts are. So there is sort of an ocean land connection there. Uh, and Sarah uh, will be getting back to her work on the French Mediterranean. Uh, and then implicit in a number of the talks today were, for instance, uh, Peter Woodbury's, if you want to restore or rehabilitate marginal lands, um, you have to bring water back in big time and figure out how to manage it. Um, emergent livelihoods and pro property adaptations to today's land rush. Uh, at least one of our summer institutes dealt with that. Uh, there were some wonderful lectures by people from the law school, Eduardo Penelvier and Greg Alexander. Uh, Steve Wolf has shared some very interesting um, insights and evolving uh, framings of how easements are being used. Uh, we heard from David Kay some interesting um, ways to think about leases as private contracts which have extraordinary potency when, it, when they're up against um, regimes of ownership. And then there's a fair amount of interest on the team and I think uh, contributions in different writings on what might be called new developments in market as well as non-market land acquisition. Sort of uh, the, the market, um, this is kind of vintage Eleanor Ostrom work. Um, Steve Wolf has been working uh, diligently, again, with colleagues and students on working forests and accountability mechanisms. Uh, Paul Dadasti has uh, worked uh, very creatively on issues of land procurement, but um, in the very interesting pre-contact or pre-treaty uh, 
temporality, it, particularly in the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, um, and British Columbia, um, that's a real eye-opener and interesting to me because the thought of native uh, Aboriginal people standing up to um, colonizing governments and post-colonial governments saying that they are offering generous treaty terms, et cetera, is not necessarily a starter as far as Aboriginal peoples are concerned um, if they never were conquered to begin with and if they never invited the interlopers. That topic, by the way, uh, thanks to connections that Paul has uh, to some Canadian scholars, will be part of this spring's Summer Institute, which takes place on May, the theme of which will be occupation. Um, my interests also fit into this particular area of uh, non-market land acquisitions. As uh, Steve said in introducing me, I've been and continue to be very interested in uh, property transfers under martial law and occupation, both military and post-military occupation. So let me stop. There, that's, uh, I hope, a short list, but a solid list of things that we have worked on together and enjoyed very much and turn instead to things that we haven't done or done enough of. Uh, here, I would put at the top of the list intergenerational land transfers, um, land and children. And I'm not talking necessarily about intergeneration, two generations out or, or seven or 20 talking about immediately. Um, I think we could do a lot more on our campus about uh, nature deficit disorders and disenchantments of our own children and how to make a difference in that. Um, and instead of nature, just substitute the word land. Uh, student debt, it's monumental. It's one of the worst sore spots in our country. It's an embarrassment. And it means that young people can't afford mortgages and equity in home and in raw land. So a huge part of the American story, mythical or otherwise, is uh, maybe not going to be told, or at least is problematic now as a consequence of our inattention to, or the competing kinds of demands on young people financially. Ian Bailey did again, uh, to go back to his talk, uh, a nice job this morning in his presentation on barriers to entry and how risky it is for young people to go into agriculture with such thin margins. Uh, I really appreciated that. Land and technology, in a way we've dealt with that and in a way we haven't. And I guess it's just because, and it came up repeatedly in today's uh, presentations, because there are so many different kinds of technologies. You could think of uh, the, the last presentations on calendars. If our watches are a form of technology, certainly our calendars are, and the proliferation of different kinds of keeping time in calendars is a kind of technology. Um, and a lot more could be done, and I'm sure will be done on that based on what I heard. Um, there certainly was explicit interest in the ways in which I think Ritwit uh, asked uh, an appropriate question on how land could be uh, retrieved, improved with better technology. That's a classical concern. Uh, Peter Woodbury uh, reminded us that rehabilitating marginal lands is going to require uh, not just water, but also technological reimaginings. Um, David Kay and others talked about hydrofracking and other kinds of mining that have become possible and land uses that followed as a consequence of uh, new technologies that are happening very, very rapidly. And then lastly, I think we could talk about, um, oh, I did talk about that. I'm going to move on to uh, the topic of property and ownership, not just as a legal technical uh, matter, which we've enjoyed, but as a lived experience and a living experience, uh, the duties and responsibilities of ownership are 
marching forward, rushing forward in ever so many contexts. Now, be it the public trust doctrine or even more casual renderings of that topic, but people are no longer satisfied with talking about a bundle of rights. There's a companion bundle of responsibilities and it's reaching to animal rights, to human rights, and on and on, community rights, ecological rights. Uh, that's very exciting and uh, a huge area in which we might work. Climate change and land use experimentation, maybe that doesn't belong on the list of things we didn't do in light of the many people who commented in, in sober and interesting ways today about whether it's the deep time or the other ways in which uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, climate change and issues of property right, rising sea levels. Um, that's, that's just a very promising and demanding area. I was so happy to hear in the last presentation and nuanced even earlier today, reference to poetry and art. Uh, Ray Crabe currently has uh, an exhibit. I'm not sure I have the title right, but I believe that uh, some of Ray's interest in, in sort of drama capitalism, dealing with catastrophes and self-protection and defense um, has uh, graphic expressions or photographic expressions, and those are currently on display. Um, where are they, Ray? Tell us again. Well, actually, the exhibit's not up anymore, but it was the uh, uh, Shanghai and University of Hong Kong. So it, it went through April 1st? Was that it? It was last summer. Oh. <laughs> Well, I want to acknowledge that and just, um, this is the Institute of the Social Sciences and it's, it's been so important that we've had people from the humanities and natural resources as part of this project. It's really helped us to stretch across campus and so the bringing in literature and, and poetry and art and photography, I mean, the, the, the observations that Peter Woodbury made today that there are so many GIS uh, representations, which are misrepresentations, that actually moves into the area of art, doesn't it? It's a very interesting topic to think about. Um, and Ithaca has this, I can't think of his name at the moment, but a very famous uh, photographer who downloads these global images and has turned them into a very successful and an important art form. Uh, we could do more of that and we could understand more of that. Urban land is something that, other than coincidentally, I don't think we've adequately focused on. And starting with the basic questions, uh, came up, Daniel, in your presentation of uh, Ugandans who might be leaving their parcels behind and going to uh, urban centers. Why are so many people migrating off the land to urban areas? And what happens when they get there in terms of their diet? their lifestyles, their use of land, their memories, their recollections. Um, Victor's paper um, brings up another very interesting topic. He led today uh, helping us understand Manchuria and sites of extraction therein. The whole topic of energy and land, with the possible exception of David Kay, uh, helping us to get at the underground, who owns it, what its relationship is to surface ownership, leases, et cetera, I don't think that we've uh, really begun to deal adequately with the big picture of energy and land. Um, perhaps a last topic is the, the straightforward, we've talked a lot about science and land uh, in one of our summer institutes, expertise in land, but the more, simply put the role of universities in land um, as staging areas for new strategies, new ways to think about rights in land, uh, applications of land, retrievals of land. Um, the, the presentation uh, that shared with us Ian McHarg's work in what essentially was an environmental impact statement in the 1960s before NEPA of where the highway corridor 
uh, should go for I-95. It's a classic example, for better and for worse, of university involvement in land decisions. Oh, I see I forgot there was one area that we did accomplish that I didn't acknowledge, and that is haiku poetry. And I want to thank Sarah and Ray. I think the two of you did the most haikus in the project. So thank you so much, and to all of you.